Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for. How's your coffee? <laughs> I haven't sipped it yet. <laughs> so cold. And <laughs> so thank you for getting up so early to attend this breakout. So hi, So it's the two point oh phase one and phase two the offer experience. This is the agenda today. So um, for the first ten minutes is the opening and and uh, is to design action and other ten minutes we have uh, Carl and Barry who will introduce the phase two use case based on the their two uh, solutions. And then we have uh, about uh, thirty minutes for the S1 discussion and then hopefully we will have a five minute break. And then uh, we will for our core team they will uh, give us an uh, introduction of the phase two uh, the current experience. Then uh, we will have about 25 minutes to discuss uh, deeper about the uh, experience of phase two. And then the other 25 minutes is about workshop transitions that most people uh, care about. And yeah, finally we have the ending. So this is the uh, we have a collaborative notes here, and if you want to give some input here and taking notes, please uh, scan the QR code. And um, also, if you have some question that we might not have time during uh, the breakout, then you can also note down here. And hopefully, we will have time uh, at last to answer it. And we encourage that we have, can have more conversations and discussion in this room. And so we only have two mics today, so if you have questions, uh, please raise your hand and maybe... And maybe come up front here. Uh, yeah. We're going to empty some of these seats up here in front probably so that you can, if you want to like engage in a slightly longer exchange, then feel free to like grab one of these seats up front here. And when you are speaking uh, at the beginning, please uh, tell us your name and yeah, just hi, I'm Xiao Wei, and uh, how, how about blah, 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 like that. And okay, so we hope that will be a fun breakout, and, but please uh, be quiet and nice, and I know you are <laughs> all the great people here in this room. And okay, yay for the breakout. <laughs> I'm Yatsik, by the way. Um, during the day, uh, I work for status. During the night, I dream about proof of stake and randomness. <laughs> um, so just quickly about what we're about here. Um, by now, maybe you've heard this like five times already during this uh, event. Another like East 2 thing, but um, the idea is that East 2 will be delivered in these phases, and each phase sort of represents a little feature set. Um, I think a good reason for doing it this way is because we can live test components that we release, like not the whole thing at the same time, but we will start with the beacon chain. And the beacon chain, you could say that it's a fairly simple component in, in light of everything that will be released as ETH2. Um, it's a single piece of software. Um, it's a single chain, and it starts by adding two crucial features, you could say. The proof of stake, which will give us security and replace proof of work. And then the randomness, that sort of, first of all, yeah, gives legitimacy to that security. And second of all, perhaps it's useful if you're into like gambling and stuff. <laughs> um, the other thing we're doing is that we're kind of shooting an arrow from East 1 to East 2, you know, when you're building a bridge over a canyon, like that's what you do, you sort of, and it flies over, right? Uh, this is the one-way pegging from East 1 to East 2, so when you want to 
to become a validator on ETH2. We have this bridge that sort of connects the two chains in this direction so that we can keep track of what's happening in terms of deposits, in terms of people wanting to put a stake. Um, and we're launching this so that we can validate these things before developers start using the chain, right? So it's intended really for enthusiasts and people that want to stake early, and want to learn how to run the system, they want to learn how the validator client software works, they want to set up the infrastructure so that we have time to sort of do this um, without the pressure of having that developers on the chain really. Uh, then we'll move into phase one. And phase one is, is sort of the first time that we add a bit of complexity to the system. We add shards, how many we'll see, maybe 64, maybe a thousand. Um, and it's all about starting to prepare for execution, but still not doing it. So we'll have a couple of examples of what you could possibly do when you have shards on, onto which you can put the data and where the chain guarantees that this data will stay around for a while. Um, um, so if you look at how that works, we have the beacon chain that is coordinating the data chains. You post data on your chain. On your, on, the, on your shard chain. And this gets recorded on the beacon chain regularly. And it's a way of communication, basically. So within a single shard, you already have the data available, and then you cross-link it so that it's available on the other shards as well, in terms of security. Uh, but you could say that each shard lives its own little life. Um, and then finally, in phase two, um, we had the execution engines, simple or not, or maybe we just do this one and done. But conceptually, that is a separate piece of infrastructure that will enable people to develop execution engines. <coughs> now, we had long conversations about how to like, present this to people yesterday. Like One of the ways that we came up with it is like, up to phase one, that's kind of like when you design the computer and and the new computer it suddenly is a multi-core multi -core processing uh, unit and then phase two is kind of like somewhere between the operating system and the drivers and the firmware it's still not something that we expect everybody to do like if you're a DAP developer you're probably not going to release an EE if you're designing a large contract system uh, with many moving parts, then yes, maybe. Maybe you have like the special um, need for it. If you're designing the EVM replacement for Ethereum 2, yeah, then you will design an EE. If maybe you want to integrate um, zero knowledge proofs or let's say that we want to pin something like Zcash inside of there are one, then maybe you want to develop an EE for that. But but these are like they're not Bob's bat or something that you just deploy like they would like to be fairly costly, both in terms of development and in terms of deploying into the chain. Within that little world, they might offer application development as we know it on Ethereum one today. Uh, but we'll start with uh, two presentations that will introduce sort of phase one and what, what you could potentially do when you have um, phase one available uh, with battery. Okay, so I'll just give a quick introduction to Zika Roll and then Carla's going to talk about Mr. Roll. Uh, these are two kind of scalability solutions that we might use on these two. So, um, oh wait, these are, these are my old slides. <laughs> Sorry. Is that right? So, okay, so the way that ZK Rollup works is that we have a, 
We have a zero knowledge proof that we use to compress the state transition. So the state transition includes the signature verification and the Merkle, the Merkle tree updates. Because we do this inside a zero knowledge proof, we have a we know that our system cannot enter illegal states. So if someone wants to steal money from someone else, they can't do it unless they have a valid signature. They or that's better said by saying they can't create a zero knowledge proof unless they have someone's signature. So when we when we create the zero knowledge proof, we have like this implicit proof that we have an implicit proof that everyone's uh, we have an implicit proof that the signature exists and that whoever had that signature. So inside systemic, we do. That's my second. Oh shit. Okay, that's alright. Okay. <laughs> 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 I, I, I said one batch of slides and show what you said. No, this is too complicated. You make it. That's complicated. So these are the complicated slides. But I, I don't, I don't <laughs> Okay, so did you see here? This is our this is our, our database in some snack. Uh, so we have a Merkle root, and this is everything that we keep on chip. And we use the snag to update this Merkle root. Yeah. And you see at the bottom of the chain, you see these A, B, C, and D. This is like the uh, this is like the each account. This is the separate A, B, C, and D. And each account has a public key associated with it as well as balance on some hash. So B is equal to the hash of all of these things. Yeah? So you have a balance of token and a hash. And, and, and a public key. Yeah. So we use this now to update this. Yeah, so this is like, you have a list of transactions here. And each transaction is into the zero knowledge proof, and this red box is like, what's happening with the zero knowledge proof. And here is what's happening with the smart contract. So we have, State one or, or Merkle root zero comes in here, and then we make a proof that updates it to Merkle root one. Yeah, so we put the proof on chain, as well as we, yeah. So we we put the proof on chain, but we have a problem. It's like this data availability problem. Yeah. So there's this like data availability problem that if someone updates a Merkle root, you're not able to calculate the next Merkle root. So or you're not able to sort of update the system because we want to have multiple people who are able to do state transitions. So what we do is we also reveal a diff, yeah? So the diff is basically, if I am Alice and Deborah, and Deborah sends one token from Alice to Deborah. So if Alice sends a token to Deborah, we, the diff is basically the, the two address, the from address, the from address, the two address, and the amount, yeah? And, 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 and that's enough to reconstruct the whole tree. So it, it turns out that this is pretty pretty compressible because we just use the indexes in the Merkle tree. Um, so this becomes very succinct footprint on the blockchain. Yeah. So we put the snag and the and the like diff between the two states. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, with that not um, remove the privacy elements? Yes, this completely removes the privacy. Yeah, so, so we use snags here for their succinctness and not. Yeah. So let me go through like an idea about how this works. So, okay, so inside the snark example, what we do exactly is that when we receive a transaction, we validate the signature, and then we prove that the public key of that signature is equal to the public key of Alice's leaf. Then we. Oh, <laughs> Then we prove that Alice's leaf is in the current Merkle tree. Yeah? Then we update Alice's leaf. And we use the same Merkle path to include that new leaf into the to update the Merkle root. Yeah? So so what's happening here is is we're changing one leaf in the tree, and because we use the same Merkle path, we hold all of the rest of the tree the same. Right? Um, so then we update Alice's leaves by removing the <laughs> Uh, but by removing the, uh, but we reduce our balance and we update, we, we come up with like an intermediate route and then we have some money that we've taken away from Alice and we want to give it to Deborah. So we use the signature and we look up the, the two leaf, the leaf that's supposed to receive it, and we prove that that leaf is in the updated Merkle tree and then we add the money to that leaf. And then we do another Merkle proof holding the other Merkle path constant. Yeah, it's all the leaves the same. Okay, so that's basically how the snark works. 
And then we can also do this for like a global state or different kind of state transitions. So instead of, in the previous example, we had like Alice and Deborah, and both of them had like this constant, they, they both had like a personal state, but there was no idea of this global state. So if you want to do something like Uniswap, you need to have a global state that people are able to update under certain conditions. So that's kind of, that's something else that we can do. We can come up with this global state and we can kind of store it and update it. Um, so, the, the, so, so then we can kind of apply these roll-up patterns to other things. Um, yeah, so that's, is that enough? Is that okay. Yes, is there a question? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say, could you say again what the what data you're putting on chain to achieve the data availability? Well, you said it was the diff between the two states? Yeah, so it's the minimal data you need to reconstruct the state. And for the token transfer example, that minimal data is the two, the fraud, the two address, the fraud address, and the amount. So it's the only ones that were touched in the new state groups? In the new, in that state transition, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it's every time they were touched. So, for example, if I said two address... The intermediate versions. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Why is the data availability guarantee of phase one, or phase two, uh, sorry, phase one important in this case? Okay, so what we can do in this case is we can. So at the moment we can put all the we have to put all the data on chain, and this is kind of expensive. So what we do is we put it on chain in each one, and then we get to like 500 transactions per second. And when we have the new set, the new uh, hard fork, we will be up to around 2,000 transactions per second. But if we had say our phase one, we could theoretically put this data on the sharing, yeah? and then just look that data on our smart contract. Two different people uh, publish a uh, transfer at the same time. One of them will invalidate the other, right? Because they don't have the same. So in this case, we have okay. So we have like two roles. Oh, so the, the question is, and I mean, you know if this is correct. What happens if two people publish a transaction at the same time? Will there be some sort of state conflict? Okay, so in that role, we have these kind of two states. We have the users, and we have this kind of aggregator. We call them the coordinator. And the coordinator receives a bunch of transactions and they process them to make a, 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 a Merkle proof. Oh no, they process them to make a certain proof and they put that on chain. Um, so if it was two of these coordinators at the same time, it would be wasted work. So we use a single leader, we use a, a, a leader election process to select them. One example of what we could do is we could do like a proof of stake and randomly select them. And we have some other ideas of like possibly better ways to do that. Is it possible to separate the logic for the token transfers and the logic that verifies the um, Merkle proofs of the lease from the like Snark circuit? Is it possible to move the to put the Merkle proofs and the signature verifications in separate things? Well, you can like that could be kept. Maybe the signature verification is not in the Snark circuit. And only the Merkle proofs are in the verifying the that the leaves are, you know, leaves of the the tree root. Okay, this is possible, but it would likely have some overhead. So, for example, if you did this, you would have to come up with a list of the. Okay, so you verify this this signature somewhere, and then you you have to have a list of the of the of the correct state transitions, and you pass those to the snark. Well, I guess we already do that because we pass the diff to the center. Um, yeah, so I guess you could do that. Do you have like a, a, a case where that would be? Well, yeah, just a case to, if you have some complicated, you know, business logic or whatever for the the token transfers, then you don't you don't have to write that in a snark circuit, and it can be instead in just regular contract logic. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you would validate the signatures inside the snark, and then I would do state transition. And you would take advantage of the snark groups to reduce the the data usage. You don't have to have you know it's like an EE and state list. Then um, you don't want to have to pass you know all this Merkle proof data, and instead you you know compress that in a I snark. I see. Yeah, that's interesting. Let me think a little bit more about that. Well, that was a great transition. 
one of the one of the, the uh, Casey's kind of question: Can you just use the snark for the Merkle proof and then calculate the actual state transition somewhere else? Well, in fact, you can. And one of those places is with a dispute game. Okay, so I'm going to talk about optimistic rollup. How many people in this he uh, room have heard of optimistic rollup? Okay, medium. That's pretty good. How many people think they understand optimistic rollup? Okay, that's a lot fewer. That's unfortunate, but it's a fortunate. Actually, no, it's a fortunate thing because now this is maximum impact. Now, <laughs> optimistic rollup is yet another way to scale Ethereum. It works in ETH1, it works in ETH2 phase 1. It is one, one of these schemes where you embed a blockchain inside of Ethereum, right? And, and ZK Rollup, the way, that, the way that Barry was just talking about it, you know, you can kind of think, about, think of it as here is the Ethereum blocks, right? Here's, here's our Ethereum, and here's our blocks, and here's our chain. And ZK Rollup, what Barry was talking about, is kind of putting these like other blocks, the ZK the ZK ZK R, um, the ZK Rollup blocks inside of these guys, right? And building up its own chain, which has its own properties, right? And so it turns out like doing this can actually be more efficient, and that is because of one very very cool thing, and that is that the uh, uh, computation is not expanded with Moore's, Moore's Law, I really like this, but bandwidth is. So it turns out that data availability is much cheaper than, and much more scalable than computation. So what we're doing is we're like separating the, the kind of communication message passing uh, logic from the actual hard like computation that all of the nodes are doing. And so this is ZK Rollup. ZK Rollup, you're building up this chain inside of this other chain. And it's really good because you can prove up front, succinctly, with zero knowledge proofs, that each one of these you know, state transitions, each one of these commitments, are correct. That is a very, very nice property. However, you don't get it for free. Because zero knowledge proofs are currently, and this doesn't, you know, this may not be the case forever, but for the next you know, five years or so, we're not going to see easy to build general purpose zero knowledge proofs. But we can still use the roll-up scheme. But we can use an optimistic scheme instead. So optimistic roll-up, here's what we do. We say, okay, we're gonna put blocks, you know, Ethereum style blocks inside of Ethereum. And we're going to commit them, but we're not going to validate them. So we're gonna commit all of the transaction data, we're gonna commit, you know, state routes, you know, it's okay if you don't know what a state route is, but you know, committing transactions, state routes all the information you need to compute the block. You're committing it, right? And you're not computing it. That's a very, that's kind of a, a strange thing. You, the, the consensus forming nodes of Ethereum are not computing it. But an off-chain, as an off-chain user, as a, you know, a company, as someone, you can compute it and check locally whether or not those state routes that this computation was done correctly. But because we are doing this thing where we're not computing it up front, it's possible that something invalid gets through. And that's a real problem, but it's not the worst problem because anyone who computes this can prove immediately without a single, you know, it's not an interactive protocol, it's just going to the main chain, say, this is wrong. And then what we can do is we can say, okay, we committed this block, then in the next block, right, this is maybe, maybe a little more clear, hopefully, in this block, so here we committed this block right here, boop, and then in this one we're like, oh, there's some fraud. And so we raise a red flag, and we delete this block, and then in the next block, we build another block on our chain, starting from the last valid block. And it turns out that doing this very, like, relatively simple scheme, we actually get pretty significant scaling benefits. So the, the scale that Barry was talking about, we get that as well in optimistic rollup. And the benefit is we get that with general purpose computation, in that we can build an EVM, you know, a real, you know, like a normal, quote, normal solidity developer experience inside of Ethereum with better scaling properties using this technique. 
So this is a really, really nice thing, and it actually borrows a lot of, you know, in, uh, kind of inspiration and, and, and uh, uh, you know, this is, this is very similar to the stuff that's going on in ETH2 with all of the sharding and data availability separation, and it all plays really nicely, and once we do have ETH2, then we'll just have way more ability to kind of post data. So it just kind of scales us up pretty, you know, pretty significantly, maybe linearly with the number of shards. Um, so I think that's kind of a high level overview. The benefits are scale, the downsides are, or the, the, the downsides, um, I don't know, there are no downsides. It's one of those things, right? It's just incredible, incredible, incredible technology. What's the, what's the question? Um, what's the size of the fraud groups and does it scale with size of data or computation? Or Great question. So basically what you can think of the, the fraud groups, you need to commit intermediate state routes frequently enough that you can evaluate that full transition in one block. So you say like, okay, we're going to you know, cap it at two million gas in internally, and so we, we basically you know, can only do two million gas worth of computation. So you do the full state transition in the case of fraud? Yes, we do the full state transition. And we go from one committed state route to the next. And are there timing assumptions on when you have to get this fraud group in by? Great question. So interestingly, this is almost like a side chain inside of Ethereum. Or like, you know, it's like it's kind of like a weird, you know, it's, it's somehow the exit procedure is a little bit like, uh, you know, reminiscent of just a normal, you know, bridge. Where essentially what we do is we say, well, for, for one, we don't actually need a finality period baked in. Like, that's kind of something that you could add on. You could just say, we'll revert infinitely far back. But that's not really uh, that realistic, considering on the main chain, you might want to say, you know, submit a transaction, which then deposits some amount of ETH, right? And we, we basically want the ability to then withdraw that ETH eventually. And to withdraw the ETH, we need to have this liveness assumption that you're talking about. And so, because I decided it's one week, it's so one week, that's exactly the time that it will take to find the frogs. Hey, question. So, uh, yeah, so frog proof goes in, and we now build on it basically a different route because we're skipping that transaction. Yeah. How do you do that without um, halting the chain? Let's say it comes one week later, and now you have to basically rebuild the chain, or um, other validators or sequences who are uploading the route are just not going to build on top of this because they technically know that it's wrong. Um, I guess what what is the reorg process look like, and what happens if the fraud proof doesn't like go up until four days later? Great question. Okay, so technically I'm doing some some simplifications here, right? Um, realistically, there are two things that are happening. There's this kind of log of transactions. These are all the different transactions, right? But 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 tons of tons of transactions, and then here's the log of state routes. Right, and here's a bunch of state routes. And so the you, you basically use some set of these transactions to generate one of these state routes. Right, and then you use another set and you generate another state route. And so if, there, if this guy is invalid, right, then what would happen is we would have to basically reprocess all these transactions based on, you know, the actual, you know, reprocess all the transactions after this state route. So like once we challenge it, we delete the state route, we would not delete the transactions, and then we just reprocess everything. So it, 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 but it does require a reorg, and if you're like, if it, if it gets in four days ago, and you know, you bought some, some ETH or something, or you bought some token, and uh, it's dependent on an invalid state route, then yes, you, you, will, you may not have your money, but that's why someone has to check. Uh, so, uh, what kind of consensus, like, for example, uh, what kind of criteria do you propose to block in the Europe chain? And if it is a fork, supposedly, uh, maybe you kind of find not a lot of police, but I like validity. Mm -hmm. So, in that case, if a block is being reverted, um, how would this block uh, work? And how to determine which one should the canonical chain? Do you mean the you mean a fraud here or fraud? I mean yeah, fork. Roll, sorry. Roll, roll of chain. Roll of chain. Roll of chain fork. Yeah. Okay. So Ethereum thankfully gives us a total ordering of transactions, which means that there is a deterministic way to determine the fork. And so really, you can think of this chain as literally a list of blocks. Like like the data structure that we use is just an array. And so 
realistically, all you're doing when you when you say like have a fork, you're just like destroying one of the elements and then reinserting a new element, right? So there there is there isn't this isn't like a really forkful thing because we don't need a forkful thing because we have this deterministic ordering from Ethereum. Yes, I'm wondering what what is the effect that. Well, what is the impact if someone falsely yells fraud, and what is the penalty of doing so? Well, oh yes, thank you. What is the impact? Sorry. What what is the impact? I cannot do that. What is the impact of? Wait, sorry, I forgot the question. Now. Yeah. <laughs> If an attacker falsely claims fraud on a block, and what is the penalty of him doing so? Great. So this is actually related to a question that I didn't a answer from you uh, also. I forgot to, to mention the first thing. So the question is, what is the impact of fraud? And the question that I forgot was, what does it take to, be, to, to submit one of these blocks, I believe? Um, so you need a bond, right? There's no question that we need a bond. So essentially, when you submit a block, there needs to be some money at stake that can be you know, slashed. And so what we do is we, we burn most of it and give some to the rewarder. Is that not your question? What was your question? No. If I falsely claim that something is a fraud. Oh! You just lose your gas. It's great. Because it's all deterministic, right? We're not playing this interactive game. You, are, you submit an invalid fraud proof, and it literally just reverts. Like, like if, you know, Ethereum opcode revert. So Ethereum checks it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the fraud proof is correct, so like it's smart contract. Right, the fraud proof is full execution of a block, so it's just spending two million gas, which kind of sucks. And you know deterministically, so why would you do it? Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So because uh, you have a period of maximum reversion to leave, um, and you have a total gas limit on chain, mm -hmm. you, have, you have a theoretical max amount of these chains that you can securely support on Ethereum, correct? Uh, great question. So you okay? Uh, I don't know if I feel, if I. So say you can only revert like say the revert period is one yeah. block. Like you can only revert in, within one block. So you have like ten million gas to play with, mm -hmm. and so you can't support up or chains that sum to. You can't securely support or the sum of or chains that sum to more than ten million gas because within the one block revert period, if everyone was fraudulent, you couldn't you couldn't support rollbacks of all of them. So you can extend that to like think about the week long of, of those. I I'm not I'm not sure if I understand, but I don't believe that we have this problem because you like even are are you saying like um, if this is invalid, right? Like the way that I prove it is I just prove this is invalid and then I just delete everything here. Right. So that but, would yeah. But if you. I know what you're saying. You're saying that if you have a block on your side chain that has that takes more computation than you can do on the main chain, no, there's no the way. Sound. No, right, but if you have a bunch of sound. chains, yeah. okay, you, you all bunch. individually think you're secure. So, um, so, but then there's not enough gas on chain to real revert in time. Go on. So you can solve this in two ways. <laughs> a snark. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what you can, this is up to the chains to decide. They can have like a higher bond. At a longer timeout period, yeah. So if you have a if you have a bigger bond, you need to have a shorter timeout period. So this is like a this is like a we can solve this by having variable bond length or timeouts and, and and variable bonds. Because if you think about it, I'll get more money if I slash someone on a chain that's a bigger reward. So I'm in, incentivized to have a higher gas price. Is that it? I'm saying. And we can talk about this outside of this. But if if you have, so you have like five chains, and they all have they they all have a max of two million gas, uh, and they can all revert. Like they have they have one block with which they could do a challenge and revert. Um, so that they can all they can all fit into that block on chain and like do their reverts. But if you now have six chains off. Uh -huh. Off chain, and, and now it's 12 million, and you have one block to be able to do the, the actual reversion, and usually you'd have a much more time period. So, so I, I, think yeah, you can, it, I think you can't do that. Yeah, yeah. You can, I don't think you can because even if they're all submitting blocks, and like let's say they're all of the invalid blocks are progressing, like one honest user is going to eventually, before one week, submit one transaction to delete all of those blocks in no, one go. No, Carl, he has like um, a contrived example where there's like one day and there's just, and there's just oh, one and there's block one and block not enough time okay. to get in. He's given the example of, okay, this I is definitely see. not okay. I see, I see. Right. Okay. So, and so, 
That's definitely not okay. So there's probably within that week there's also a maximum that you can support. I see. A maximum number of versions you can support, thus a maximum number of change you can securely support. Got it. Yeah. All hail the one optimistic roll up chain. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I think I think yeah, it's well, parameterization will will help here. I think I think during this conversation two important things came up. Uh, the guarantees that that are useful for, for these kind of setups and that phase one offers is first of all that we get the deterministic ordering of blocks, right? And all the computation happens off chain. So you, but but that's what the critical feature that phase one offers. So if in terms of if you want to develop your own application, this is like one of the guarantees that you suddenly gain now. And then Ethereum one already has that, obviously. But the second feature that we gain here, that Danny was alluding to, is increased bandwidth, right? So there's suddenly 64 or 1,000 shards um, that you can submit fraud proofs, for example. So you're not as likely to end up with a stuffed chain, right? I'll just be highlighting these little points along the way, like how you can think about phase one and what kind of applications you could develop in it. That's great. So, uh, the question uh, is from the previous survey that some, like many of the uh, the others, they feel like the button bottleneck uh, prevented from migrating to their two. Mm -hmm. That two question, uh, two things that they are worried about. The first one is the it's not decentralized enough, mm -hmm. and the second one is they don't think there is not security. You know. Mm -hmm. And what do you feel about? How do you two, uh, feel about the security assumption of here of the Both. of your yeah solutions? So I, I think that like what what Danny was getting at is, is kind of close to a nice differentiating factor between the two systems. So with with zk rollup, you fail when when you have too many transactions, when you have too much throughput, you just can't put any more. But with optimistic rollup, if you have too much throughput, then you have this kind of situation like you were describing, where, where you don't have enough you don't have enough block space. But instead of just not being able to fill it all, you have this kind of weird condition where someone might be able to attack if there's like a coordinated attack against every 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 optimistic rollup chain. However, I think that the economics of running that attack would be would be kind of expensive because you'd have to burn on all but one chain and you could you could attack one chain and you'd have to burn on all but one so it depends on the size of bonds that you have and the timeout periods but yeah I, I, that's that's one idea okay uh one i think that generally people who say this is a great layer two a lot of the times are not really like telling you about a secure protocol and so I think that it's a very well-founded kind of you know fear it's like oh this is a great layer two it's totally secure and they're just kind of like you know hand-waving half the design space so I think that that is absolutely correct and uh, I, I also don't think that this the, the kind of like um, block uh, congestion problem for generally layer two because this is a problem of you know state channels of every layer two that's based on the di dispute period if you you know fill up the blocks then you're then you're kind of out of luck however I want to just really really quickly talk about the the kind of asymmetry in the attack defense scheme here that that makes this dispute you know uh, this this uh, a, mm, dispute like censorship problem really really hard to to achieve um, so if I have some value of, you know, let's say, you know, a thousand, right, that's locked up in a dispute that I'm, go that I'm scared of losing, right, then I'm willing to send in a transaction, a, 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 and like a Ethereum transaction, that pays like 999, you know, <laughs> like contrived, but 999 uh, gas to get it out, right, I'm willing to burn a lot of money to you know, kind of save this because I'll be making a profit. Otherwise, I'm going to lose it. So at, at worst, I'm trying to get at one dollar. But an attacker has to fill up all the blocks, right, for some time period of like you know one week, um, and they have to be above my maximum price the entire time, right? Or it's just like a total censorship attack of, of Ethereum, and then we're like 
add Ethereum sec this, uh, security. So like this means that what I'm willing to spend one time, they have to spend continuously for the entire censorship period, um, which is, you know, I, I think a, a reasonable attack defense model. Uh, what, if, what if they deploy a Ponzi scheme during that one? <laughs> yes, so <laughs> we definitely want layer one to scale. This is not, the, we, like, if that's what you're looking for, yes. Oh, sorry, where? In the back? In the back? All right, in the corner? Just speak up. You mentioned that you need to keep the optimistic goal up well small enough so that you can generate a fraud proof that can run within a single block. Um, is there any way of enforcing that? I mean, if I'm a bad operator, can I just create a massive block with some coordinates that's too large for anyone to produce a fraud proof? Yeah, that's a great question. It's really nice because it's enforced in Ethereum. We just run the block, and if the block runs out of gas, then it's a fraud. Can you explain again why you're saying the attacker has to pay for the whole week? Because I thought that like it would be me and you and whoever wants to submit our fraud proofs against the attacker that would be paying to try and get all of our fraud proofs in. Um, whoever is paying for the fraud proof, the fraud proof is going to be like this, and then the attacker needs to fill blocks that are you know paid gas above whatever that is for the entire week. I um, thought the attacker, all he would have to do is submit a bond of invalid routes that we all have to then pay gas to get our blocks in. I think, yeah, probably good to take, take it offline, but, um, yeah. I think we have, we're going to start the explicit discussion time, so it's like a, a weird group. We have like five minutes left before the break. Okay. Oh. okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, go away. Go away. So, no, just um, ask for more. So after people knowing uh, the base solutions here, how many of the people here are interested in making your devs above their two solutions? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we at with the state of actually being able to use these as a dev developer? Um, so with... Um, ZK rollup, uh, we're still kind of focused on the payments as a first proof of concept. I think that that makes a lot of sense to, I think that we like have a responsibility to prove to people that this is secure, at least in, in like a, a, a limited version before we start to kind of try and push more people to build on it or support them. So that's that's kind of what we're working on, to just do a, just do a proof of concept, or like not a proof of concept, but make a real thing that actually works and stays stable for a while. And after that, we will have all the tooling that we need to, to make like generic apps with ZK Rollup, and we can kind of explore from there. Um, this is also a really good. Well, this is also a really good time that if you have an idea for a kind of application of, of phase one, you could now also ask if like these skilled people that have gone through the motions think that it could work with the properties that you get on phase one, so like, use the time. So just you know, to ask a question, like, who's willing to make a solution built on this? And there weren't really a whole lot of hands raised, and listening to this, I got a lot of cognitive fatigue, because it seems like a deep technical dive into things that aren't confirmed yet on the phase one. So for example, it reminds me a little bit of when I was trying to understand plasma. And, and so I spent a tremendous amount of cognitive load trying to understand Plasma as a developer, and it sort of feels like it's for naught now. So in this discussion, it's very, very interesting. However, as a developer, I have a certain amount of bandwidth for this sort of low-level protocol understanding. And so I think maybe if you could just sort of say the stuff that we've talked about in the past half hour, how much of this is locked in and confirmed that it won't change in terms of uh, these specs you've just discussed now. Okay, so the question is, um, the question is, can I summarize? What, what do I care about as a developer? I can, no, no, I can also just sort of say, how much of this is for sure not going to change in the next three months set? How much of this is for sure not going to change for three, in three months set? So like the kind of, I think the kind of strategy that we and Carol have, and other people who work on this stuff have as well, is to try and build things that will work on layer two and will also work on these two. 
like for my layer, my work is all focused towards layer two of each one. Just because I, I have the same concerns as you, I don't want to build something that, that's going to change. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe we can check with Danny about? <laughs> <laughs> I think it more specifically means regardless of which data layer you use for yeah. availability, like, is, is it worth actually learning ZK Rollup? Like, is the, is the notion of this protocol going to drastically change in the next four months such that the cognitive overlay you, overhead you might spend today to learn it and begin thinking about how to develop on it like might just be thrown out the window in four months? I think that's the question. This is a great question, and I think that people should not really have to learn this at all. In terms of answering it on face value, I would say like a solid 90%. 95% of what I talked about here is just this is literally how optimistic rollup works and we already can get smart contracts on this right so like this the, the I think that the big problem with layer 2 thus far has been we have been talking about you know protocols incentive reasoning and like expecting developers to actually you know have to learn about how these different parties are going to interact in these different worlds and how they're going to you know you know, do you know, play out some dispute game. Like, I don't want people to think about dispute games. I just want people to write smart contracts because that's what got me into Ethereum personally. Um, and so this is the, the entire reason why I'm interested in optimistic rollup is it's the fastest way to start scaling and improving the user experience of Solidity smart contracts. I think it's an interesting observation as well. Like it, when I, at the beginning, alluded to that we're fairly early stages yet, it was also to raise awareness that in entering phase one or even two discussions right now, you need to get fairly deep in the weeds. Like if you want to develop an execution environment, that's fairly deep, right? That, that's a bit of work. Um, however, um, we've already torn out a couple of these simple properties that you can already like start imagining what kind of solutions you could build on this. If if you were to do that, right? What do you guys think of Lazy Ledger? Woo! I mean, I just really like it because it seems like a nice separation of concerns. Um, what but is it? Oh, Lazy Ledger is like a minimalistic data availability engine and says, okay, we're going to provide availability and ordering for transactions but we are not going to necessarily uh, do uh, a like execution thing. So people can essentially execute based on the you know data that is provided by the lazy ledger. It, how, um, is it, how is data availability going to be? It's erasure encoding and some. It's like a pretty nice simple scheme. Is it um, are people staked or do you get slashed or is it important? <laughs> I think it's staked. Tenderman, Tenderman BFC. Okay, so in general, I think that solutions like that require you to lock up as much capital, uh, a lot of capital, and you're not locking up more capital than you can transmit in your system, because otherwise someone can can just disappear the data, and you can't update your system. So, like the an example of this going to its logical conclusion is is you have the whole world's transact economy is built upon this like lazy ledger application. Well, no, half of the world's capital is on lazy ledger, and the other half is on Deposited on like collateral on lazy ledger. So how is it different than ETH two? Well, ETH two is okay. All right, all right. So here, here's the difference. Here's the difference. So ETH two, if there is a data availability failure, you roll back the chain. You recover from that failure. So you roll back the chain plus you roll back the execution engines. But if lazy ledger has that, because there's not this tight coupling between the execution engine and the data availability engine, you won't be able to roll back. You roll back lazy ledger, but your execution engine, you'll have to have a hard fork. To add to that, yeah. to that um, if you're talking about phase one on ETH2 as a data availability engine with without execution, then this rollback is happening in an ETH1 contract with execution. All right, we're going to take a short break. Um, I think phase one gives you data availability, right? It's like a strong guarantee that the data that you get is ordered and stays there. <coughs> uh, and you do it with the big list, but without the execution.
Cool. So this is to give an overview so you guys have a general understanding of phase two, and then we'll dive into the uh, DevX discussions. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, I gave a talk on day one. It's kind of going to be similar to that, but I'm going to breeze over a lot more um, and go through this a bit quicker. So. Uh, we talked about phase zero already, so I don't feel like I need to cover this. Um, Yasik did, so Beacon Chain is kind of this organizing layer, manages the cross links, the uh, finality of each of the shards. So, um, and then phase one, we already just talked about this, shards is data availability layers. Um, so, we get that. Uh, in phase two, uh, this is where I say it brings the shards to life even more, um, because now they have state execution uh, on them, so now we can do generalized computation on the layer one protocol. Uh, so to kind of give you guys an overview, so to help you understand the new, I guess, framework by which uh, phase two is being proposed, um, it's all about these things called execution environments. And so I'm going to give you an example from uh, ETH1, um, and hopefully that extends your mental model appropriately. So um, in ETH1, we can say that there is one uh, execution framework, or uh, one execution environment, and it's just enshrined into the core ETH1 protocol. It's hard-coded. Um, it's hard-coded into the nodes. Uh, so if you want to change it, you, you have to fork. And so a really good example is a transaction in ETH1 um, has nonce, gas price, gas limit, two value data, all these fields, uses RLP encoding. Um, and if you want to change any of this, if you want to add a field, if you want to you know, adjust, use some other encoding schema, um, the way to change that is you have to change the uh, the core protocol, right? And, and so you have to do you have to do a fork and change the um, change the code. Uh, similarly, um, you know, in ETH one, uh, the global state um, is managed by a Patricia Merkel tree, um, and each account or each leaf uh, kind of has these fields: nonce, balance, storage, root, and code hash. Um, so if you want to change that as well, the account structure, if you want to add a field, use a different um, different accumulator, so instead of a Trish Merkle tree or anything like that, um, again, it's the, the same thing. We have to we would have to do you know fork on ETH1 to change that. And so to review this, basically in ETH1, we just have one transaction framework, we have one execution framework, we have one execution environment that is essentially hard-coded into this system. Um, so uh, ETH2 kind of took, takes more of a radical shift, um, and it says, you know, the core consensus doesn't really need to have a strong hard-coded opinion on transaction structure. Uh, the consensus layer is good at managing a lot of overhead logic, um, so this is ordering of blocks, fourth choice rules, um, execution tooling, right, so this is EWASM, um, slashing rewards of the validators, different things like that. Um, and so it takes kind of this radical shift that the core protocol doesn't need to actually have a strong opinion on what a transaction structure looks like, um, or what you know how an account is organized and what fields are on the account. Um, in fact, you can you can support multiple um, in the same uh, all in the same shard. Um, and so this this is the radical shift that we no longer just have one enshrined hard coded uh, uh, transaction uh, system or um, account framework. And so, um, I, this is kind of a goofy little diagram, but I think it like helps people understand. Um, so on a shard in ETH2, you can have multiple execution environments. So um, example, uh, we're gonna bring ETH1 into a shard, right? And so ETH1 itself would be an execution environment. So here we're saying this is just all in one shard right now. We're not looking at the system as a whole. In one block and one shard, we could have ETH1 running. Uh, we could have an ETH2 EE, which I'll talk about in a second, which is a iterated account model. We could have a UTXO-like, you know, Bitcoin model. We could have a ZK rollups focused uh, execution environment. Um, we could have Libra um, move running on ETH2. So, not me last, but but we could, you know, just to like kind of give uh, give the illustration here. And so within each of these EEs, you you get this synchronous communication within yourself. So. Um, in the ETH1 EE, nothing really changes as far as transactions or contracts being able to call other contracts synchronously. Um, but then you have to think about asynchronous communication when you hop from one EE to another. So the ETH1 EE is going to call the UTXO or the um, ETH2 account model or the Libra EE. 
so DE is execution environment. Um, like I said, you could have Libra, you could have a lot of things. You could put a Haskell interpreter if you want to in an execution environment. There's, there's a lot you can do, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, so diving deeper, what does this actually look like? Um, so the beacon chain stores these peer reducing functions. Um, and so these give the rules by which transactions will run. So this gives the rules by which transactions are validated um, and will um, and it bounds what the actual state transition would, would be for, for that EE. And so this is just a pure WASM, um, WASM reducing function. And so uh, to give an example, um, in ETH1 you could kind of consider um, you have a state, right? Um, you have a function that runs. That function has a bunch of transaction data. Um, and the output is you have a new state, state prime, um, as prime. Uh, in ETH2, we do have a stateless model, so we can say this is actually pure, um, because now we just have a pre-state hash um, uh, reducing function, and it produces a post-state hash. So um, in the example here, um, each shard, if there's a transaction that is ETH1 related, it you know pulls down the WASM uh, pure reducing function from the beacon chain and then executes this package of transactions for the ETH1 EE um, appropriately. And then the same block can uh, do it for an account model, um, and I'll talk about that in a second, or for um, a UTXO model, or another account model. So um, yeah, so we're already kind of you know playing with this. Um, so uh, Alex and uh, the Iwasm team created a repo called uh, Scalp, um, which already lets you uh, do um, prototyping um, on these execution environments. And again, this is what the function would look like. It's process block, takes block data, pre-state root, and it gives you a post-state root hash. So again, it's exactly this. Um, so, uh, okay, there's some debate here, and maybe this is what we talk about today. So execution environments, they're not necessarily analogous to smart contracts, they could be. Um, so for example, um, an execution environment like ETH1 EE, right, uh, defines an execution environment where like more code can run. So smart contracts can kind of run in this world um, of the ETH1 EE, so it defines how continued code can then be executed with it, or how continued contracts can be executed. Um, so it can define WASM running more WASM. Um, with, uh, I think this is an interesting quote from uh, Drost. Uh, with EEs, E2 abstracts the fixed execution semantics of almost any conceivable programmable blockchain in a similar way to how ETH1 abstracted the fixed semantics of digital tokens, currencies in the early blockchain uh, Bitcoin era. So I think this is cool. Um, so the ETH2 EE, what we talk about, and this is still under debate because there's some other perspectives, there's this umbrella model or a non-umbrella model, and we could go into that in a bit. Um, so the ETH2 EE is saying, you know, we're trying to do a lot to make the ETH1 um, compatible and bring that over into, um, as an execution environment in, into ETH2. Um, but we've realized there are a lot of better accumulator formats that we can use, there are a lot better models that we can follow, there you know, are a lot of things that we learned, and so we can make another EE that is focused and generic on running smart contracts like ETH1 that's also an account model. Um, but we can make it, you know, even even better, and we can make it more WASM centric. Um, and so this is the concept of an ETH2 EE. Um, yeah, I think EWASM. Uh, this is uh, uh, state execution happens within the consensus of each shard. Everything is um, all the execution is centered around EWASM. Um, EWASM provides metering and uh, concept of gas limits and um, yeah. Um, uh, skip that for now. Uh, so this this system is uh, stateless. Um, I don't I don't know if we we need to really dive into that too much to, during today's session. But in case you're curious, um, so that means there are actors in the system that hold state, um, and so there's a lot of you know discussion uh, discussion on this. The the best example that I can give for a stateless system is with your transaction you provide the database. So. Um, if I'm, you know, submitting a transaction where Will Villanueva is uh, transferring five ETH to Xiao Wei, um, so I need to prove um, what my account currently looks like and what my balance is. So I use a, you know, Merkle proof to do that, um, and I need to prove what her account looks like as well. And so I, in this case, I show that I have six ETH, 
and Shao Wei has three ETH. Um, and so now when the uh, block producer executes the transaction, it basically just pulls from the proof that I gave. It pulls from the submitted database that I gave with my transaction. Um, so that way validators, block producers, they don't need to know uh, anything about the state. They can just pull from the, uh, this database that comes with uh, each of your transactions. Um, switch over. So uh, Vitalik did a really cool post on this um, just recently. So this is where we're bringing ETH1 into ETH2 uh, as an execution environment. Um, this means that we need the EVM built in WebAssembly, um, and this would be defined in that EE script that, that we talked about. Um, uh, Hugo on the EWASM team has been doing uh, you know, really, uh, really good um, work on that as well. Um, but there's a lot of work to do here. There's still, you know, it still needs to be prototyped. It still needs to be, um, you know, kind of, yeah, established. Uh, E2E, I talked about this, you know. Um, this is kind of an iterated version of Confrap check framework. Uh, it's wasm centric. Um, yeah, and, and so um, then we'll go into cross chat transactions. So, um, you know, there's kind of three spaces here that it falls under, and I think today we'll probably just focus on the first one, the asynchronous core protocol. Um, so, uh, basically, that's, you know, you wait until finality. Um, once you get finality uh, for another shard, then now you can trust the message that comes from that shard. So that's typically would be considered slower, but it's secure, it's safe, you know it will never roll back, it will never reorganize. Um, there is a new proposal that uh, Vitalik has made um, which limits, so cross our transactions now would only happen in one block. Um, so that's actually really cool, and that, that's somewhat bearable. Um, so I think before finality would take about six to 18 minutes. Um, having one block is, you know, six seconds um, to make a call to another shard. And that's, that's really cool, um, but uh, there's always, with every proposal that you read, there's always gonna be trade-offs, pros and cons that uh, come with it. Uh, then there's this whole uh, model of optimistic systems. So these are like dependency graphs that kind of reorg themselves. Um, with this new proposal, we wouldn't need those anymore. Um, but these do, uh, the idea is you can use basically almost these like hybrid systems that um, allow you to get cross shard transactions in one block, um, assuming that it will finalize. And uh, hopefully that, that um, we won't need that anymore. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the, this you can get like synchronous cross shard transactions through. I think uh, optimistic rollups is a really good example. So this is where you know you in a, in ETH two like if you bring optimistic rollups to ETH two, uh, you can now uh, upload your data on four different shards. So user, if they want to upload their transaction, they can um, they can access any of those four shards. And so now they're not um, you know they it's. Yeah, you get, you get a lot uh, extra there as well. That's pretty cool. Um, delayed state execution, it's kind of all falls under the same, uh, the same branch of things. So um, when you think of cross shard transactions, how does this affect DevX? Um, in general, uh, let's just like focus on the asynchronous side. The synchronous side, it really shouldn't change that much. And this is, you know, let like Carl and those guys talk to you about that a little bit more. Um, on the async side, the difference is, uh, uh, so HLLs, higher, uh, higher level languages, DSLs, um, so Viper, different things like that. So this, um, these tools should just provide proper tooling now. Um, so what that means is as a uh, DAP developer, um, you now need to uh, operate under um, this idea of you are gonna make asynchronous calls um, in, in the smart contracts that you write. And you need to be aware of that, and you need to be open to that, um, and then there may be even, you know, some, some things that you need that um, would re require more than just asynchronous calls, so uh, different tooling that should be included in, in, these, um, in these systems, which can be akin to programming cross threads. So uh, if you need to make an atomic transaction, um, you know, the hotel train problem, uh, you know, you, there are different approaches that you can go with. You can go with a locking system, read-write, which essentially rolls down into this like yanking model. Um, you can have a two-phase commit schema, which could essentially also be kind of a messaging model. Um, you can have a message-driven approach. One of those ideas is like the actor actor model. 
um, and then just simple asynchronous calls. So it kind of depends what you need um, with your contract. You, as a developer, are going to need to understand um, which one of these tools, depending on you know what you need. A, a lot of developers will probably only need asynchronous calls. Others may need some type of concept of an atomic uh, transaction across multiple contracts. That's when you just need to use the best tool. But most of these toolings should be provide, provided and developed uh, within things like Solidity and Viper. So um, just think of it as uh, you know, you're know you dealing with asynchronous calls now, promises, whatever else. Um, and the latency depends on how long it takes uh, for um, reduced for finality time and or if you know this this you know new direction is taken, um, you could get that latency just in one block, which is actually pretty cool. I think that's you know a lot of people can uh, work with that. Other changes in DevEx, um, yeah. So POS provides some some things. Um, you know, there's some speed increases, some execution costs may decrease due to there being multiple shards. I don't want to draw too much attention to that line. Um, Web3, Ethers, JS, these, these things, they, Web3.js, they actually shouldn't change that much if you're dealing with an ETH1, the ETH1 EE. Um, their core machinery under, underneath it all will change for sure. Um, but for the most part, if you're dealing with the ETH1 EE, it shouldn't change drastically. There might be some changes um, from your perspective, especially if you're writing new contracts that might be shard aware. Um, but again, it, it shouldn't it should much. And, in fact, I imagine that there will be this world where there will be standards around these new EEs that are built. And so web3.js can basically be portable to uh, these different EE models. And I, you know, I, I think this is like a really cool space and I just would love to see more people you know, kind of ideate and you know, get involved on some of these things over time. Um, it, we're likely to have more WASM-centric smart contract languages. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I don't think, you know, Solidity or Viper were um, necessarily built with a WASM-centric approach. So, um, you know, that, that will likely, you know, come and affect developers as well. Um, so, should I build an EE? So, if you're a protocol researcher or developer, absolutely. You want to experiment with new accumulators. You want to experiment with, um, you know, different, uh, different approaches like that. Yeah, you should. Um, do you have an idea which only makes sense as an EE? Um, does your application need more flexibility um, or enhanced scalability, right? Um, then you might want to, you know, work on an EE um, for, for the application. Um, but also you may just get left behind if you don't learn this. And you don't learn to leverage that to your advantage or you don't at least learn to understand what's happening behind the scenes. Um, I think there's a good amount of discussion regarding EEs. Some, uh, some parties believe you know, that there should just be you know, three or four or five EEs and that's what everyone uses. Others believe that the, you know, the amount of EEs, it, there should be an, app, an EE per application and then we build a model by which EEs just kind of communicate with each other. And so it's kind of these two camps. Um, I think they all have their trade-offs, pros and cons. Um, and whatever happens, I don't necessarily think uh, the things that I mentioned just prior should actually affect the DAP developer significantly. Um, so yeah, that I hope gives a like good overview for everyone of what phase two is. Um, I'm generally uh, optimistic about things. Um, yeah, and I, there's a lot of people uh, much much smarter than me who are working on this and building uh, building. EEs and um, again, I just want to you know like call out like you know Alex, Paul, and Casey here. And, um, I mean, phase two is phase two because of Casey, um, you know, in large part originally, anyways. And um, there is a session where um, you know the EWASM team has worked on a ton of different EEs, and um, it's like really really cool to see a lot of the uh, innovation and creativity here that's happening. It's like really exciting. A lot of smart people are working on this. So, um, yeah. I, does anyone have any like overview questions? Yeah. Um, as someone who's following this from really afar, uh, actually two questions. So one is, I, I believe that back to the day, I think it was an interview with Justin Drake. He was saying that there would be only one execution engine across all shards. And now this is new to me, so I was wondering where the shift 
has happened and all the rationales behind it. And the second question is, so if we imagine different shards having different execution engines, how do they come about? I mean, does the foundation decree at some point we'll have 1,024 shards and five of them have this execution engine, ah. etc.? I assume it's not the case, but I mean, how do you envision that to come about? Yeah, so I think Justin kind of takes, you know, one one side that's very, very strong, and then there's kind of the other side, which is just let everyone, every DAP developer, write an EE. So these are kind of the, the two the two different ends, right? And I think it hasn't been resolved. Like, those discussions just need to happen, and this is part of what we're doing by prototyping and looking at it. I tend to think that there's probably just going to be, like, a gentle balance. This, this is my opinion, and in no way is the opinion of, you know, all the researchers or research team, so, um, and Alex and Casey and Danny and everyone here might have a different opinion than me. My, my general opinion is that there's a delicate balance um, where there are like four EEs that um, are kind of entry EEs. You know, you write smart contracts for, they already have the standards, they're just easy to deploy to, you don't have to think about complexity, what accumulators you're gonna use, you don't have to think about these things, right? But if you want to, then you're free to launch your own EE that can then um, integrate with these. Because I, I think not allowing developers to launch EEs is like, I don't know, this is gonna be a huge area of innovation where we can learn so much, you should definitely open that up. So that's that's my general like thought. Um, although I think most DAP developers will be operating across, you know, maybe four major EEs that, that are, you know, the most popular. Um, I think uh, your, to your question uh, for deploying an EE, uh, the idea is that you have to pay a large, you know, a fairly large sum be, uh, to deploy an EE onto the beacon chain. Um, and then uh, what is unknown is whether that EE is now just available across all shards, um, or whether you need to, you, you need, would need to pay to deploy it on each shard individually that you want it to operate on. So like a shard can have multiple EEs running. Does that, do you have access to all the shards just by deploying once on beacon chain, or do you have to also deploy on each of the shards that you want the EE to run on? So I think, again, these are research questions. We're not entirely sure, um, but I think we'll probably have answers, you know, um, hopefully fairly soon, you know, in the new year's time as we continue to just uh, prototype these things, and yeah. So as a developer wanting to develop on one EE, I would like to find other people that have an interest in that EE and, and pull our resources and then Deploy that yeah, yeah. So maybe you know one one really good example is the ETH one EE, right? So that's you know probably the Ethereum Foundation stands behind that, provides um, kind of the funding to deploy that, um, and there's already an ecosystem around that. But now let's say there's a new account model that people you know support. Casey's going to say something in a moment. Um, a new account model that people support. Um, and it uses this cool new accumulator format and a bunch of developers want to work on that and start writing contracts for that. Yeah, you kind of organize your own, um, your own approach to do that. Um, but you could also just, I see also a world where I can just, you know, play if I want to, you know, depending on how much it costs, I want to deploy an EE and experiment with it on my own, and I, I could do that. Um, but again, I, I think, you know, there's a lot there here. In case you want to I was comment or Okay, Danny, you want to comment. Oh yeah, I, I think you kind of covered it, but essentially, like the beacon chain is this highly available uh, component of the system. Like, if you're syncing any shards, you're also syncing the beacon chain, and so having having data deployed on it, having these EEs deployed on it, can and and must be expensive, um, and so uh, I don't in, in my I don't see a world in which it, it makes sense to deploy in, in a world in which DApps are highly used across all across the globe. The, the cost model can't be such that every DApp is deploying their own EE. Um, you might some like mega casino DApp might deploy their own EE as like some strange advertising thing, but but generally in terms of like hand like being being close to other DApps and like operating in, in ways of scale and, and also the cost model of deploying something within an EE would be such so much less that like. You, you likely operate within an ETH1 EE or in ETH2 EE or, or within some other EE that we haven't even thought of yet. But uh, they're, they're tools for DAP developers, but they're, they're more like, in my opinion, 
more akin to protocol development um, in the traditional sense than they are to DAP development. Yeah, I think this question about um, who can deploy EEs and how many EEs you know there might be is the biggest you know unresolved um, question on which there's a range of opinions. And the way I like, I think the split came from the uh, prior to the idea of minimal execution when you had phase one and then. Uh, and there was no execution in phase one, and there was only execution in phase two, and phase two uh, was supposed to be this execution that was maximally similar to ETH1, and so shards, you'd have 1,000 copies of ETH1, of ETH and the execution would be stateful like ETH1, and it would, um, you know, prescribe, it would have an account structure, um, you know, a Merkle tree structure, everything like ETH, <laughs> you know, like ETH1, but better. Um, and the shift to minimal execution said, well, no, you know, these execution environments, um, the execution environments will define these. And an execution environment, it's just a fancy word for a contract on ETH2, the way I see it. And I had a slide that said, not necessarily analogous to uh, smart contracts. I guess the main difference here is on ETH1, a contract cannot uh, run EVM code. But there is an old EIP like from Vitalik to add an opcode, like run EVM. So when an EE is analogous to a contract on ETH1 with the extra opcode of run WASM, you know, or run EVM. Um, and so, in the EE, like you can you can take a uh, a viewpoint where <coughs> the EE would sort of define all this stuff that enables people to have a good user experience and and, and um, defines how like contracts call each other and so forth. Um, and so in the old model, it was like core developers would develop all this stuff at phase two, and then DAP developers would come on and then you know use deploy dApps um, on ETH2. With minimal execution, it's kind of like, uh, at least my philosophy with minimal execution is like, this is a massive challenge to, um, and, and not only is it a massive challenge, but you, it's also a very opinionated approach. And in my opinion, it's, it's like kind of authoritarian and dictatorial to say, like, well, you know, we want to restrict the EEs that can be deployed. An EE is just WASM code. So why would you restrict what WASM code, you know, people can deploy? You know, people should deploy and run whatever WASM code they want, like like they can run any EVM code they want on uh, ETH1. So I will, and I, I, I uh, my opinion, and we, this is like we're on, we're on in terms of developer experience. But I will speak to the opinion of, of Justin, which is there's some validity to it, and he's not here. Um, EEs, uh, if we have this world in which we have ETH1 EE, ETH2 EE, and a, and a movie EE, and a this EE, and, and, and some other EE, and then another one that, that looks like ETH1, but it's not, but it's a different one, we have this world in which we might end up having like a very fragmented ecosystem, where um, if you instead have some sort of enshrined EE to start, and this is like the other extreme of the opinion, um, where it's ETH1 and, and you, it feels like ETH1, it feels like the account models that we know and love. It's one, a very like clear developer's story on how to build on this, and two, like kind of creates this unified experience where everything's in a, in a, a cohesive ecosystem. So that's the, the counter to the dictatorial uh, view of the opinion. I'm not certain exactly where I, where I lie, but I just wanted to get that out there. Hola. Last. Okay. Uh, since you cannot update EEs and it's fixed, if you do end up with the enshrined EEs and you keep improving those EEs, how are you going to deploy them? Is it going to be a hard fork or? And I'll give the mic back over. But the, I think it's 
very likely that at least one of these EEs is still potentially updated by a hard forking and social consensus, the ETH1 EE. So I don't think that it's... Even if one EE code is replaced by a new one? Right. I think that, that it, I think that it's going to be very hard to say, this is ETH1 now and you can never change it. Like everyone exists and operates in this, there's tons of stuff there, and like I think the social consensus of still hard working it might very well still exist. But we have this is not quite what we're here to talk about. <laughs> That's the latest yeah, I, need. I wanted to break the discussion a little bit here because it became very deep and I actually wanted to give um, the microphone to you guys and like listen to questions, reactions, thoughts. Should you guys come up here? Feel free to come up at any time. Yeah. So, um, one question is basically we are doing a lot of controlling. Um, but the controlling will also relate to some kind of partition state, right? But right now I haven't seen a lot of discussion about how this state being partitioned, especially we have now different EEs and they have different states, and how this E will deal with that. And all, or maybe this shrubbing more like kind of individual subchains that work on kind of like uh, independently. Um, so I'm not sure how this E and together with sharding or this state partitioning looks like. Um, yeah, so your question is uh, in a sharded model with cross shard transactions, you end up getting your state fragmented across multiple shards, right? Okay, and how do you deal with that? Um, Especially in different EEs. Especially across, from EE to EE, you're saying? Uh, okay. No, no, from shop to shop to EE. Yeah, that, that's several. Like, so, so first we have one EE, define one account kind of state model, and how this thing partition. How to define this partition with this EE. Uh, probably another further question is, is possible of EE change the state of another EE? Um, and since also, and because these two are highly related to how the state is being partitioned and how they are coordinated with each other. So the current, the current proposal space, and again, things are all under research, is um, so you can build, like in building your EE, you can basically have standards by which another EE could call into it and make, you know, some, probably make some type of message to that EE, right? Um, but uh, again, this would be like a, an asynchronous call that you would have to make it to the EE. You're not guaranteed that it will reach that separate EE in, you know, until maybe a couple blocks or um, whatever, whatever else is there. But I think that is more up to um, how that EE is written and what it allows other EEs, how it allows them to um, call into it, how it allows them to integrate into it. So I think uh, that's that's a big space that needs to be explored. Um, within one EE, the fragmentation approach, if we get cross shared calls to be pretty quick, then I think that sort of solves that problem. But yeah. <clears throat> yeah, just uh, taking a step back here, I uh, have a pragmatic question. Uh, if I want to build an EE, uh, how do I get started? Like, is there a, a documented API or something uh, that is available uh, now? How do I? Based on the previous discussion, you may may not would not be allowed to do. Mm -hmm. You may not be allowed to do it because <laughs> there's only one inside the skeleton. But. Um, so the, the tool uh, Will mentioned, Scout, um, there is an intro search post which explains the API, uh, but I believe after that one we may just move that into a spec within the Scout repo. Um, and there, so there are a couple of examples there. Yeah. Scout is the sort of uh, interface? It, it's just a, a prototyping tool we have for EEs specifically. Okay. Uh, and it has examples of how to write these EEs, so that's the best source to look at. Uh, so I can also speak from a client perspective, like what's going to happen is that the beacon chain will get um, deployed first. And around that time, you will also start seeing clients that deliver the data availability part to phase one in test nets. And then uh, a tool like Scout, which is a prototyping environment, basically gives you access 
this data availability, and a little sandbox in which you can play with EEs. Right? So that is kind of available now to start playing with, and some of the primitives are being developed. So the idea would be here that after having heard Will's excellent explanation of the new toys that you'll be able to play with, like threads, and of course you can continue to work like you did in ETH1, and that would be like you buy a 16-core computer and just use one of them, right? But then you get a bunch of new toys, and the idea here is then that you can start experimenting with developing the primitives that will help like end-user developers to have a nice um, fluid experience of, of, of doing development. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so when I make a transaction, you said that I have to provide the metal proofs, right, for the state. So, but how do I know what the state route is the moment the transaction is executed? Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, here, I'll let Casey answer. So this goes back to the uh, API, and what the current API has like five um, methods for you know phase two execution, you know EEs. Uh, one of them is get get current get pre state route. So you know this is stored on the on the shard, and so in the WASM code, you pick get the pre-state route, and then the other one is return post-state route. So you do all your logic, then you return the new post-state route. And then the next transaction, when it calls get the pre-state route, it will get that new, you know, <coughs> the one that was returned from the previous transaction. But what's the question within an EE or from the outside? Yeah, from the outside. Mm -hmm. From the outside, you're saying the, the, the actual execution of the EE. Yeah, so this is, so getting the state route, um, you can, that, that's available from the system that ETH2 provides, but um, if you're wanting to get the state and you need the state to, in order to generate a multi-proof, um, this introduces basically there's a new actor in the system. Um, these would be what we call state providers. Um, and there's, you know, right now, like three different proposals. Um, one of them makes the state providers even more essential in what we call relayers. One of them kind of removes the relayer aspect and we just need you know, someone who will provide state to you. Um, and so this is an open area of research. I think we're all going to be looking at this, start diving into this after DEF CON uh, collaboratively and hopefully we will be writing some uh, you know, good research posts on this. Um, in, in general though, um, from the simplest model, there's this idea that um, you could pay to access state. Um, so maybe there are actors in the system that um, that would you know require some type of you know microtransaction uh, in order to write to give you a witness that will end up writing state um, that gets submitted as part of a transaction. Maybe they give you um, state for free to read. Um, you know, in in order to kind of build that model, um, we already have like generally altruistic actors right now in ETH1. I think in general the idea is to eventually go away from the altruistic model. Um, you know, ETH1 is generally supported by a system of altruism, right? So. I think there is a, some hints in the data flow as well. So the way the system is built is that you go from a pre-state you execute something into a post state, and that already tells you that from the perspective of the E2 consensus, you have to provide that pre state to the function that is executing, and then E2 verifies that the output is correct per, per that calculation, right? So something has to provide that state, and what that something is, um, up for debate. Do you pay somebody? Do you keep track of that yourself? Um, you'd have to have a really nice computer for that. Um, will this be provided by a service network of some sort? Excellent question. Um, I'm just trying to understand uh, what are the possible uh, ramifications for end user experience with EEs? Like, is that a concept that the end user would have to be aware of? Or? I mean, it depends what EE your your contracts operate with, right? So. 
you're working with uh, is one EE. Hopefully very, 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 very little changes. Um, mostly all the machinery and tooling behind the scenes, um, what network your wallet is connecting to, you know, the in, but the interface for your wallet shouldn't change drastically. The interface to Web3.js shouldn't change drastically. You're still using Solidity. You might have a few extra tools. Um, now someone builds, you know, a new account model EE or something else that has some new constructs. Hopefully there are standards that are built that um, kind of give you, we continue to not need to change these toolings drastically. That's, that's my hope. I think we want to strive for that. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah, it, it ties back to an earlier question about partitioning, but how do we expect to maybe speed up E21 if we assume that this E21 EE is going to have maybe the same throughput as current Ethereum 1.0? Maybe it will have a higher. But if we want to significantly improve the throughput on a system similar to E21, will we try to partition it? Will we try to deploy multiple? Eat one ease or eat one shards, and then will, will they be like different networks, like mainnet one, mainnet two, mainnet three? What do you guys think? So I, I generally think bringing all the contracts that exist in ETH one right now, when you bring them into ETH two, um, the scalability that you get from that um, won't be drastic. Like you're still running on one one shard. Um, because contracts that exist are immutable and they're not shardware yet, right? And you can't just change the contract to make it shardware. Um, and so you will have some speed gains from proof of stake and the execution time that you know we're shooting for. Um, I think where the scalability would come is new ETH1 contracts that um, can can now be shardware. So new ETH1 contracts that can interface with old ones um, and can be written in this approach that it understands that there are multiple shards. So maybe a lot of dApps um, are okay with, you know, the minor scalability gains by moving ETH1 into ETH2, but now they want to take care of the extra tooling, so they might have, you know, some type of social consensus to move to a new contract that now utilizes um, shard-aware specific tools. That, that's my general thought. And Danny, Casey, do you have additional thoughts? Right, so moving moving ETH1 into an EE opens up a number of questions, like what do you change, what do you have to change, what can you change? There's certain things like an op, uh, the difficulty opco, like what does that mean in this new context? Like you have to define those those things. Uh, there's other opportunities to potentially migrate from partition Merkle, Merkle tree to binary Merkle tree. Um, and then another one of these opportunities is to um, open up the notion of, of sharpening, as, as he was saying. So you could, you could easily just deploy it on, on one shard, it doesn't have any notion of sharding. It now exists in, in um, ETH2, but it's kind of a single shard paradigm. It does have access to make proofs about the entire uh, data layer of ETH2 at that point. Uh, so you could you could uh, get a lot more scalability out of, out of some of these layer two schemes uh, that were discussed earlier. Uh, but then I think one area of research and one thing that we'd like to push for and is to open up the sharded paradigm within ETH1. And as he said, existing contracts wouldn't know about this, but New ones, uh, new ones go. Um, still, definitely up for debate on what would change during that migration process with any one. Are there are there techniques for dealing with situations where you provide the pre data, but that data changes before your transaction is being mined? So, say I want to send you a transaction, um, but my my transaction is in mine until like 10 blocks from now, and in three of those intermediate blocks, your account balance changed. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's actually um, pretty easy to do, just with the Merkle proof data, if you have two Merkle proofs and they don't know each other, and if they don't know about each other at the time of being submitted, and then one transaction gets processed, then the other proof, as is invalid, but there's already the information there to update, you know, refresh the proof. So even if that's like several blocks or maybe several days apart, if the chain is congested or something. Well, if it's several days, you would need, you know, all the 
the intermediate transactions that were processed in the meantime, but... So, so, so like to know you've hold on to that information for the past couple of blocks? Wasn't yeah, and that's, I mean, that's what we've been referring to as maybe uh, state providers or relayers, and that's where they come in because they will, you know, um, have this role of like updating proofs and so forth. So, um, are solidity smart contracts associated with a specific EE? Or can they run in other EEs too? Um, in the normal case, you'd probably have like a, a notion of a smart contract being deployed within the EE and operating in that environment. You do probably have the opportunity to, to think about new type of layer two constructs that maybe in a layer two context kind of exist within uh, multiple EEs, um, but that's definitely like a new area of research and design that's not really been explored that, that much. So if I create an EE, how can I develop uh, smart contracts for it? So the EE would define, uh, in most context, the EE would define some sort of account model, some sort of deployment model, some sort of, it just all the things that you think of as like, is ETH1, like those things are now like in terms of account model deployment, all that kind of stuff and how transactions are interpreted and, and modify the state, that would be then definable via the EE. And so within, within an ETH1 EE, those mechanics would still operate very similarly, but if you wrote your own EE and you wanted a notion of contracts, you might have to borrow some of those concepts or make new modifications and new new ways in which things might exist and operate. Um, so again, like, yes, these in some respects look like contracts, but they also can look like protocols, right? They're, they're like a con contract, pro like you define the user layer kind of protocol via these, this new type of beacon chain contract, thus being. And I think one of the I mean, the biggest difference between uh, deploying your own EE versus deploying a contract, um, you know, like a child contract of some parent, you know, EE, is deploying the EE might cost, say, $1,000. That was like a number, you know, Vitalik, you know, pulled out of the air um, a few months ago. Whereas deploying a contract, you know, a child contract, on underneath the EE would cost maybe a few cents. And having, you know, paying the $1,000 to uh, deploy as the EE just means that the code is like already there. And so, you know, you'd be able to run transactions within it, you know, many more per block. Whereas if it's a child contract, maybe, you know, you have to pass in the code every time and your throughput would be less. I mean, this is what, you know where the trade-offs are. Yeah, and at the same time, you've also now fragmented your universe from other like you. You now will require uh, like asynchronous communication to another EE. So you're missing out on some potential um, like synergies in, in just deploying into an existing EE as well. And and to speak to that, like a thousand, like because the beacon chain is this component of the system I mentioned earlier that like. Every node has to run this thing to be able to sync and run shards and sync data on shards. Um, it, we have to bound the state size, and so like this capital is like likely uh, burned or, or locked up. This, the economic model is still under investigation, but it would be capital intensive because the state needs to be succinct and bound. And I prefer locked up just in the same way, you know, if you want to become a validator, your validator account is, you know, it's a, an account underneath the beacon state. So every validator bloats the beacon state. So in order to limit the bloat of the beacon state, it costs 32 ether to become a validator. Um, and it's not burned, it's just a deposit. So we can take the same approach with deploying EEs. Right, but then you get the idea of an EE disappearing at some point. So there's, yeah, a, there's a, like all sorts of things to, yeah, it, it, explore with yeah. terms of that. <laughs> Um, in the in the minimal dictatorial model, um, uh, would you have arbitrary state and arbitrary computation on that state, just like really intense state rent? 
Um, can you elaborate a little bit? Like intense uh, state, right? Or, you know, you're like locking up uh, some amount of capital to keep some kind of state because everyone needs to hold this state. Um, and I'm just curious if you would, uh, you know, allow in this model arbitrary state and arbitrary state com uh, calculations. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess I should qualify with in the uh, dictatorial model where. Um, it, <laughs> the, architects, <laughs> the, the architects of the system restrict what EEs you can deploy. Like, there, it might not make a difference if it's the type of EE where um, users can deploy any kind of code they want under that EE. So, if that is the case, then there's, you know well, what layer are you operating at, and maybe it doesn't make a difference, users can run any code they want anyway. Um, and if the role of the EE is very minimal, but if it's like, um, if these sanctioned EEs restrict the type of code that people can deploy, um, then, yeah, that's, um, that'd be a very dictatorial <laughs> Which is <laughs> certainly not the intention on that extreme of the... Uh, the yeah. All right, we have a. Sorry, I was just, just going to say real quick. I also think it'd be sad if that were the case because, like, you want people to innovate and try a lot of new things. So, like, I think that's, yeah, that's our goal. Let's still open that up. Um, so, my understanding is basically that each EE uh, has its basically a measure model that can be so on So, and also I have defined how these uh, transactions can be modified to stay either. Maybe in the uh, smart contract like e is one, and also maybe it takes all the like kind of of scripting. So one question is suppose like also others can also deploy these new EEs, and this basic ledger model also store corresponding ether value in each EEs, right? And if there's a for example a bug, for example in underflow blood that creates infinite amount of ether, or it intentionally uh, creates some. Uh, is actually uh, in this new EE or maybe existing EE, how to prevent that happening? Uh, uh, because like uh, it looks like everybody can deploy that, and the, 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 also if they can define this can. So yeah, I think so. Balances of EEs are not going to be significantly different as an example than a validator balance. They have the ability to um, pass. There's an ability to deposit. Uh, put funds into the EE and consider it validator. So as far as like funds being printed out of nowhere, that wouldn't be an issue. But but what could happen is um, just like an EE one, you need to have a very significant audit on a smart contract. Um, an EE would also need to go through that same thing because you wouldn't want it to then users bring their funds into it and then you wouldn't want it to steal your funds. Um, right, so just to be clear, um, from the notion, the, the only thing that owns Ether in, in this model is validator accounts on the beacon chain, and from the layer one perspective, and these EEs, they have they have an, uh, a certain amount of Ether assigned to them. Then within the EE, there's some sort of account structure that gives you right to like access it within the EE, the EE or potentially transfer another EE or, or become a validator. Um, so the minting of ETH. Um, outside of the normal like validation mechanism would be a like a that would be a layer one protocol bug like that would be something that the like kind of sandbox world of an EE which is just Wasm code should not be able to do and if it did like that would be a layer one bug in which we would almost work. <coughs> well, I guess the question was like if inside the protocol that EE some minting of ether. Right, possible. and I'm saying yeah. it's not possible uh, unless there were a bug in the layer one protocol. Well, there might be a bug in the EE. No, the, because the EE only has access to the ETH that is in its account. Yeah. So, so there's 10 ETH in this EE, and there's some sort of sub like account model that allows it to move around, but nothing, nothing that's moved within that EE actually changes the view of the amount of ETH within the, um, that's right. within the layer one protocol. But it might suddenly have 11 ETH inside its internal And I'm saying the only way that that is possible 
would be if there was a bug in the layer one protocol, not within the EE. No, no, no. no. The EE itself might be buggy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're, saying, yeah. Yeah. You're, You're saying the same things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're He's just. Yeah. Is there an EE might say that there's a lot of hate? Oh, sure. Even the EE is like, you have a shitty account model, and now, like, there's 10 accounts, all of them have one ETH, except one of them has two. And so, but in terms of their right to that that model within the, like, that, that ETH within the actual entirety of the layer one system, there's no, there's only 10. So, yeah, there. If you write bad EEs, you can have a terrible user experience. Um, I think but you haven't minted it with respect to layer one. There are interesting questions with respect to like an exchange that might honor that. Uh, yeah. I think the way you think about it. E two. I think the way to think about it is that within the EE, you no longer have ETH. Basically, you have representation of the mm -hmm. like, so, There's a disconnect there. Yes, you talk about it. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like a uh, rep token. If you screwed up the rep, you're going to see it. Yeah, I see it. Make one little comment. Um, it turns out also that these EEs, what we're talking about, um, you can basically build an EE inside of Ethereum 1. And that is actually what these roll-up chains are in reality. Because you know we have these balances, you go into an EE, one of these roll-up chains, and then you know inside of the roll-up chain you might have coded it wrong, it might have you know something, you know, some some issue happened, and you go out. And it turns out that there is like a very, very uh, kind of one-to-one -one correspondence. However, if you do it in ETH1, there are certain things that you can that are, you know. You, of course, we don't have the scale, and also it's much less efficient. But there is like a the, the, these concepts are um, kind of somehow not 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 a special in in, in uh, they're they're not in, like intrinsic. Anyway, I don't I don't know I don't know what I'm trying to say. Here. But thank you for for listening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a few minutes left, like one or two. Um, does anybody that hasn't spoken yet want to speak up now? Your last chance to ask a question. So my understanding about ease is very rudimental, uh, but uh, shouldn't Beacon Chain validators catch the bug? Like if there's, an, there's, there's a bug in the EE which uh, inflates the wrap ether or the EE ether, Within that contract, shouldn't they just say that, oh shit, there's a bug, they're just trying to inflate the, their own uh, if accounting and just not execute that that uh, that new state that the E proposes? Um, yeah, the beacon chain would catch, okay, this validator does not actually have, you know, go from 10 to 11 ETH out of nowhere. But if the EE you know, has a field under its own state that says wrapped ether, and it doesn't check, like, guarantee that wrapped ether amount is equal to the actual ether amount um, you know, in the beacon state field, then the EE's you know, wrapped ether balance could just inflate. Just like a contract on ETH1, the wrapped ether doesn't have to be equal to the ether if there's a bug in the contract. Okay, so so beacon chain validators are not really looking out for this these kind of issues. Yeah, mm -hmm. part of the part of the scale, but like part of the system is such that, and part of the, the fact that it's a stateless system, the validators don't have to know about EEs. They know that the code exists. And they know that given a block, they can execute on a pre-state route, the block in the post-state route, but they don't have to care about the internals at all to validate the protocol. And if they did, uh, this the system would likely be much much less scalable because they'd have to know about arbitrary EEs that, that have existed. So, so it's, it's kind of like definitely segmented in a way that the, the validating participants don't have to worry about the internals and thus would not catch that. Like part of the protocol is just execute the code of the EE, not to look at the EE and be like, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah just like that in these one box, you know, miners just run the EBM code. Thank you. Two more questions? 
All right, very quick. Anybody else that hasn't spoken yet? Something about tooling or languages. This is your chance. You have the researchers here. So maybe one question adding to this. Uh, so now, as a deep developer, I don't only have to trust like the Ethereum blockchain, but I have to trust the uh, execution environment frameworks. So they don't have a bug. True. Yes. And EE, if you're going to run on an EE, it should be well vetted, it should be formally verified, and it should be something that like makes sense for you to actually operate in there. Um, I expect a lot of activity to happen on large, well vetted, well tooled EEs, um, even if there's experimentation with all sorts of other things. But, but also, that's the status quo. I mean, at the moment, you need to trust the Ethereum blockchain and the EVM. I mean, the EVM is the execution environment. It's a status quo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, but uh, if I want to make sure that uh, I'm uh, safe, I just stick to like the uh, EVM. Because I, I know that's like trustworthy and it's proven. All right, if there's a yeah. bug right now in the EVM, we might socially coordinate to fix it. Whereas if there was a bug in a random E, we very well likely wouldn't. Oh, really? Well, it depends. But that's what the well, EVM would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's what the EVM would be. And there's, there's all sorts of questions on how you go. Let's play that. I just want to go back to the, to the first part with the rollup uh, thing. Uh, I didn't really understand, because you asked as a dev developer how could we use these new these these features, I didn't really understand how it would um, be made available to a dev developer. Would be like uh, as I understood there were no change in Web3, that's what we are mostly using as a developer. Um, what kind of tooling would there be around it? And how, how can you take advantage of this? Can we handle this? Great question. Um, so <laughs> optimistic rollup, the biggest thing that I like about optimistic rollup is that we can have the same developer experience, like as as similar, and the kinds of changes that Danny was talking about, the block, gap, you know, block difficulty, and you know, we have to change, at, you know, message dot sender. We have to do account abstraction. It's just some weird requirements. A couple things will change, but your smart contracts will work kind of as they do today. And then, you know, basically, it would require forking or uh, you know, forking waffle, truffle, whatever, and uh, you know, adding in the kind of the little changes. But you would, you know, write a smart contract, deploy the smart contract, and you'd have a you know, quote, Ethereum unstoppable smart contract, um, uh, you know, in layer two. And that that's definitely that's definitely a goal a goal for all of us. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you put an optimistic roll chain inside of an optimistic roll chain? Absolutely, yes. So Vitalik has given me, you know, he gave me this like crazy mind blowing experience um, where he was talking about, he was like, okay, you, you can think of optimistic roll as different like execution zones. So the, the, the deeper you get in this recursive optimistic rollup thing, the more execution computation you have to do because you have to do the, the optimistic rollup at the bottom level, optimistic rollup above it, optimistic rollup above it, uh, you know, and then up to the main chain. So it's like the massive amount of computation. But that gives you scale, right? Because you're, you're doing more compute, that means you can scale further. And so you can actually, you could even design a system where you're like doing this intentionally, where you're segmenting different levels of, of you know, here's uh, uh, the, the deepest level and you know you you have some some amount of depth anyway I don't think that that's like really that practical I think we'll get like one level deep and we'll probably get 90% of the way there 99% of the way there and then maybe throw another level because we're like crazy um, but you know we can and we could and that's kind of that's I think the, the big thing that I was you know that I really want to communicate is that the EVM as it is, is this like Turing complete state machine and we should all be like incredibly grateful for the fact how general purpose it can be. And so you can write these amazing systems like execution environments, like optimistic role, and then you can write those systems inside of themselves. And this computation stuff that we're dealing with is pretty wacky. Um, so I, I definitely, definitely uh, enjoy. All right, I think we're gonna make a cut there. Uh, <laughs> Those beautiful words from Carl. <laughs> General purpose computing. Um, as you may have noticed during the session, it's still very, very early stages. 
That means opportunities to affect where we go with the system. It also means that like, it's not ready for end user developers or end user applications yet. Um, however, I would encourage you to join uh, the conversation now. I would encourage you to explore these new tools and think of ways that we can use them um, once we get them out there.